Hi, I'm Wayne Tuttle and welcome to Chasing Legends. Welcome back to Chasing Legends. Uh, get a chance, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, leave us some comments. Let us know what you think, if you have anything to add in. Everyone has an opinion. And we're going to continue this week with our reading of Jim Bark notes. We're going to be only more concentrating on the um, Jacob Waltz section, just one chapter out of the 33. And then over time, we'll cover some of the other stuff, some interesting stories. But again, not, not necessarily recapping the whole thing. Watch the other video. Uh, the Bark Notes were written a time and period. This is people who actually knew Julia Thomas, Reinhardt Petrash, Jacob Walt. So it's, if not, you know, not, maybe not the first searchers, but early on, the first Dutch hunters that started. In fact, Jim Bark coins the term um, the Lost Dutchman's Mine. So having that early reference point, and it's going to be probably material that if you look on the internet or even pick up a number of different books, you're going to find it kind of stands against things. Well, sometimes your earliest source is probably one of your clearest and best sources, and especially in the area where Jim Bark's talking about the things that he was initially involved in, personally kind of partook in, the people he actually spoke to. So this isn't something later in his life that he kind of was trying to write of knowledge of, like Adolf Ruth or something. This was something that he was fully kind of in depth of and very and very much understood and spoke to these people. So what we're getting is his interaction with that first Dutch hunting party of... Julia Thomas, Reinhardt Petrash, and Herman Petrash, and Gottfried, of course. So you're getting actually a kind of insight in that first searches that Julia Thomas made. So it's an important document of the time. Um, probably more important than any other document we, that we have. So it's the earliest one, and we'll kind of go through with it. We'll see how far we get today with part two of um, Jim Barks and from his manuscript, chapter one of Jacob Waltz. The Dutch Jake Story His partner, Jacob Weiser, and himself were prospecting in the 60s, this would be the 1860s, of course, in the state of Sonora, Mexico. And one evening they came to a ranch and asked a Mexican whom they saw if they and their burros could camp there for the night. He said he did not know, but that he would go and see the Don. He returned and told them that the Don wanted to know if they were Americans. He had told the Don that they did not talk like Americans, but were white men. Well, tell them that they can camp for both of them to come up and see me this evening at seven, which they did. The Don asked them what they were doing and said they told him prospecting. He asked if they had found anything and they told him they had not. He wanted to know if they were Americans and they said they were naturalized citizens. The Don said that he was getting an expedition together to go up into the United States to a mine that had been in the possession of their family for several generations a grant of sole right to Miguel Peralta, who was his grandfather, and his heirs, to a mine in a certain territory, describing the corners thereof, there of mud, which is the same in Mexican, ten feet square and eight feet high and built like a pyramid. The three natural corners are easily found, but the fourth corner had been, in, been informed, I don't know what that quite means, by an Apache Indian was torn down by them, and it must be so as it was never found. He wanted some Americans in his party, as his title to the mine was simply a sole right to mine within certain described boundaries, and not a deed of conveyance and per 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 perpetuity. God, I apologize. Tongue tied. That it was not recognized by the United States, and that if they would go with him, he, Peralta, would give them a third of what he took out. They agreed to go, and they went up to the Superstition Mountains, had a brush with the Apache Indians on the way out, and two were wounded. Upon their arrival at the Peralta Ranch in Sonora, their share of the spoils was a little over $30,000, which back then was quite the sum. I failed to mention that there were 21 in the party, 18 peons. Don Peralta proposed to give them a bill of sale to the mine for their share of the gold. They accepted the bill of sale and came back to the mine. As they were about to camp, they heard someone breaking rock up in the canyon. So they took their guns, a double barrel lead double barreled, sorry, double barreled muzzle loader shotgun loaded with buckshot, 
the other a muzzle-loading sharps rifle, and crawled up to within sight of the tunnel. There were two naked men, all but a G-string, whom they thought were Indians. They each selected his man, and they fired. Both were killed, but when they went up to them, they discovered that they were two of the peons that were in the party that came to the previous trip. They buried them and mined for about three weeks and went back to Peralta. They found Peralta had been to Mexico City during their absence and had been gambling heavily and was in debt. He asked them how much gold they had and they told him about $60,000. He said he needed money badly and if they would let him have the $60,000, he would sign them a mortgage over on his ranch with good interest. After talking it over, they decided that they did not want a mortgage, but they would take his note, as they said they could return to the mine and get more. So they took the, they took the note and struck out again for the mine. After arrival, they concluded that they were going to run out of grub. So Jacob Walsh took the burrows and went down to Adamsville, just below Florence, where there was an adobe grist mill and a king of a general store kept for the Pima Indians. In fact, kind of a trader's store. Walsh said he was gone maybe three, four days. Right there, the first doubt about the story entered my mind about his telling the truth, as I could not understand how a miner, having made two trips in the same deposit just previously, should go in there with shortage of grub. But the explanation to this comes later on in the story. Upon his return to the mine, he found his partner, Jacob Weiser, stripped naked and his new hickory shirt hanging on a bush near him with his Masonic pin sticking in it. Doubt number two. I never knew an Apache Indian to overlook any kind of shirt, much less a new hickory shirt. The camp in general was shot up and destroyed, that the handle of the firing pan was broken off and three bullet holes through the pan, and many other utensils destroyed by bullets. Doubt number three. For if there was one thing in the world that an Apache was careful about and sparing and jealous of, it was ammunition, and for them to waste it on pans and coffee plots was entirely out of question in my mind. He said that he had buried his partner, walled up the tunnel, rolled dirt and rock over it, and took the frying pan without a handle with the bullet holes in it. There were mountain peaks just west above his mine, and that he placed his frying pan with, it, with four rocks in it on the center peak. And this, would, we would go down the peak due west, east, sorry, due east. Let me say this again, because it's the actual description and way we go to the mine. Put small rocks in, in the center peak. And then if we would go down the peak due east, we would find the mine. The center of four was another stumbling block. I have unraveled all the other discrepancies, but this one remains. And the only solution to it is that he may have said three, that no cowboy would ever find it, which I would take would mean that one cannot ride a burrow to it or within sight of it. And for some reason, there is an interruption in the trail going to it, as a cowboy will go anywhere that a trail leads. Now just so everybody kind of follows here, this is Reinhardt Petrash telling him the story. But when he's putting in the doubts, it's Jim Bark speaking. So Jim Bark, and it doesn't give that interruption in, in when you're reading the manuscript, but it's Jim Bark making a point of little problems he has in the story with Jacob Waltz, talking directly to Waltz, even though it's Reinhardt Petrash that is actually doing the speaking. So it can kind of get a little kind of turned around there. So you have Reinhardt Petrash as the principal speaker of what Waltz told him, but you have Jim Bark with putting in side notes of what he's thinking as the story is being told to him. Jacob also said that no prospector would find it, which I take to mean that it is not a mineral formation. In fact, he said it was not, and that he had never seen anything like it, and that it was very difficult to find. That the trail went over the mountains and to the mine was monumented, with two little rocks placed upon a larger rock or some other conspicuous place. He would always start on the subject of the mine whenever he found either Riney or Helena, which is Julia, idling up at the house. And he appeared provoked when he thought they were not paying attention. He would chide them and say, when I am gone, you will wish you had listened to me. Now, what's important here, and Bark doesn't note in here, and I don't know if Reinhardt or Julia told him or... But Waltz principally spoke to them in German. Um, we know from newspaper articles that he was slightly deaf and so forth, so we don't know if he didn't think they were listening to him or he was speaking loudly or they were just having trouble understanding them because of maybe perhaps the dialect of German he was speaking. But most of their conversations we find out later 
were in German and they would sit around and talk in German because they were all fluent in German, which I think is an important part, a point, because what we're getting basically from Reinhardt and from Julia is their translation of Waltz's information. Now, I don't know if Herman and Godfrey, when they came in again, if they shared everything in German still, or they were still using that translation. So we always have to remember that it's a little different um, perception than what we have. It's not Jacob Waltz sitting around speaking in English to them and then them basically relaying the story to Jim Bark in English. Bark obviously is getting an English version of the story. Old Jake said he had been to the mine but once since he left it and came to Phoenix. That was 14 years after he walled up the tunnel. And that everything was just as he had left it and he did not disturb anything. Jake was about 86 years old and evidently was not expecting to live long. In early March 1891, he told them that he did not think they could find the mine, way to the mine, that he had better get a couple of ponies and a couple of burros and a wagon and some grub and go with them as far as the new board house, where there was a woman and three children, and that was far as he could go. From there, it would have to be on horseback. He thought he could show them the trail over the mountain looking from the house, that they must wear their oldest clothes because the brush was bad. And I was a little out of order there because I lost my place because I added in. The reason I'm sure he was referring to the Bark and Criswell ranch is that Matt Cavanus and his wife built the big board house in 1877 and took his four draft horses as he had a contract to haul ore from the Silver King mine to Pinal, where they were building the mill some five miles from the mine. Mrs. Cavaness and the three children stayed at the ranch and ran a dairy. She sold butter at Pinal and the King some 20 miles away and got as, as much as high as a dollar a pound. As there were no other women or children or boardhouse in that entire country, there is not much, much doubt as to the boardhouse he was referring to. Also, the trail over into the Superstition Mountains was monumented in such a manner as old Jacob described. At this boardhouse, the, Jake, the wagon trail ended. Mrs. Cavanus told many of the cattlemen that she frequently sold flour to the Apache Indians, that they always paid her in gold nuggets, and that one time an Indian came to the house at about 10 o'clock in the morning and asked her for some flour, saying that he would go over to the big mountain and get the gold. She refused the flour, telling him to get the gold first. He rode up the trail over the mountain and returned before sundown with the gold. Will Whitlow, a neighbor cattleman, was present at the time when she was selling to the Indians, and he said she sold the milk pan full of flour for about $10 worth of gold. She told the same thing to many others. Okay, so we're getting ready for our trip with Jacob Waltz. Jake finally got his outfit together, loaded the wagon with grub, and they were planning to start the next day. Now remember, they start this planning in December. He first tells the story, and then they're going through the early, early months of the year. Okay. But that night, a great flood came down the Salt River, and in the morning, morning water was covered all the lower Phoenix, which we know we can document about, even with the time period they were speaking when the flood happened and everything here. Helena, Julia, told Riney that he had better go and see how old Jake was situated. When the boy got inside of Jake's house, water was still all around it. When he got to the house, he found Jake standing on his bed about six inches of water. The boy took him on his back to Julia's house, and finally Jake willed with all of his effects move there and stayed until he died into the summer of 1891. Now, Jacob Waltz died in October of 1891, but it's a slight, but it can be an editorial thing. Plus, it can be something in the notes he didn't quite get. I think he might correct it elsewhere. He lived several months after the flood, but was never able to go to the mountains. He could sit out on the porch at times, and when he did, he would point to the Superstition Mountains and say, the mine lies right over there. Okay. Um, and again, we, we have to remember when he sat and first told them about the mine, he's sitting on his porch, we have to figure the house faced it east, and he said it's over there in those Superstition Mountains. He didn't pay, point to the north, he didn't point to the west, he didn't point south, which also... Um, the Salt River Mountains, um, the South Mountain area was also known as part of the Salt River Mountains. So he was pointing due east and he was pointing directly to the superstitions. And Julian Riney actually went east to search. So we know that when they had the conversation with Waltz and Waltz was telling them the direction of his mind, he actually pointed to that area. Among his things that were moved over to uh, Julia's house was a soapbox, very heavy with leather hinges, a hasp and a lock which he always insisted should not be open, but was to remain under his cot. 
Everyone thought it contained ore, but no one knew. When Jake was passing away, he kept murmuring, God, forgive me, I had to do it. And then he would repeat it. And with those all around him supposed he had killed his partner, Jacob Weiser. There was an old prospector by the name of Old Germany who would drop in and see Jake. And Jake would say, tell him to go out. I don't want him here. He gave Riney three small pieces of ore and said they were from the mine. Riney got hard up, pounded out two of the pieces up, washed the gold out, and got $8 for it. Jake died without any of them going to the mountain to look for the mine. When they went to the funeral, the soapbox disappeared, and Julia and Riney each suspected the other with making off with it. But both were innocent, and it is not necessary to tell the story to mention the name of the guilty party, so I will pass it. Now, a lot of people will find this interesting because um, they will start referencing to the Holmes manuscript, and Dick Holmes saying he was with Waltz and all this stuff, and there's no mention of Dick Holmes anywhere in this. Um, they, they were aware of Dick Holmes. They, were, they did mention him in letters and so forth. There never was really any indication that they thought too much. There's some people that read, try to read between the lines in that, but uh, they never really kind of put much stock in any of the Dick Holmes material. And maybe we'll do a video on, on some of the problems with the Dick Holmes story. But in here, of course, um, we have the, you know, he's a naturalized citizen and he's going to pass away. They go to the funeral. We've heard a number of different things. Um, Reinhard Petrash had a few words that he spoke to other people concerning all this. All that we know basically is that the ore disappeared and um, what they had to do material-wise um, with what they had. We, we have a lot of um, folkloric lines that are not included in here about what they did with everything and what transpired while Waltz was there. Um, of course, this is very cut and dried. I don't think people understand as they weren't concerned while, while Bark obviously did a wonderful thing by kind of giving us something of a, <clears throat> a timeline in history here. We have a bigger problem of no one was interested in recounting the actual history of Waltz, what they might have talked about, um, if he any, any personal notes or personal pieces or information as far as him, Riney, or Julia. They were interested in more of the gist of the story and then the directions in trying to find the mine. So we lose so much material. I think any Dutch hunter would love to sit with Jim Bark and ask about some of the personal things or personal references. Ryan Harper trash are probably the three new Waltz the best possibly because he liked to sit around and talk with him and listen to his stories. And because of that, Reinhardt probably had a lot better um, depth on Waltz and his life and the chronology of his life than anyone would ever know. And Reinhardt really didn't speak to more than a few people, and he didn't seem to go in depth with anyone much on it. It was some time before Helena, Julia, and Reine could dispose of the bakery and go look for the mine. The first trip was the time I mentioned in the first part of the story. Reine told me that the first time Julia and he went over the mountain to look for the mine, she got lost on top of a mountain, and as it was sundown, she became frantic. That there were quite a number of dry rattle weeds up there, and that she got up on a large rock and stopped there all night. She carried a small thirty-two revolver and a box of cartridges. As dark was overtaking her, the rattle weeds began to rattle, and she mistook them for rattlesnakes, so she stayed on the boulder all night and fired all her cartridges away at the snakes. The imaginary snakes, obviously. This practically is the story I got out of Riney that evening, and by morning I had a list of 41 questions I asked him. Some he answered yes or no, and some he did not know. I kept the questions and changed them about and asked him the same questions again and wrote the answers about three months after questioning him the first time. And he only varied in one question, and that was the time Jake said it took to, to go to Adamsville and back. The first time it was three or four days, and the last time it was four days. At that time, it was quite important, but as the story unraveled, it made no difference. Now we're going to leave off here part two of the Jim Bark notes, and we will save, because that's literally the end of Jim Bark's discussion, initial discussion of beginning the story with um, Reinhardt for Trash. Um, there's a, quite a bit more to follow here in this chapter, so we will continue it with next week's episode of Chasing Legends. Thank you for joining us. Hit subscribe, like us, leave a comment, go to represent.com and get a Legends shirt, okay? Until the next time, I'm Wayne Tuttle, and thank you for watching. Take care.